real life. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 252, number 39 in our series from Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology. And today is an exam special, especially for all our postgraduate uh, exam going students. Uh, and we have with us Professor Siddharth Agarwal, sir, from KGMU Lucknow, and he'll be discussing all the long cases in strabismus today. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, sir has completed his med medical education from KGMU Lucknow and uh, his advanced cataract training in Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. Currently, he is an additional professor in ophthalmology and in charge of the strabismus and the pediatric vision clinic at KGMU. Uh, he is a recipient of two extramural research grants, five international travel fellowships, and has traveled uh, far and wide for his lectures and his presentations. He has 60 peer-reviewed publications and is a reviewer of several international journals also. Among the awards and accolades, uh, he has received uh, Davendra Kumar Young Investigator gold medal for the faculty at KGMU and the best of the ISA award by the All India Ophthalmology Society. He has a patent. He is a co-in charge of postgraduate teaching program of the department and he conducts about 200 pediatric cataract and 100 trabismus surgeries each year. So welcome, sir. We are uh, honored and privileged to have you here and I hope all our postgraduate uh, students have logged in and they will really benefit from your uh, lecture today. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Shafadi, for that introduction. I will be at the onset, I would be thankful to Dr. Honavar and Professor Pradeep Sharma, sir, for having me on this platform. Both of them are an inspiration for a gener generation of medical teachers like myself. Starting with the topic. So the first reaction when one of you gets a strabismus long case is that why am I the unlucky one? The next is that you try to find out the diagnosis from a helpful colleague or your senior. You must understand that strabismus cases are usually high scoring and easy to pass as the examiner is well aware that the understanding of postgraduates about this topic is limited. Also, the answers are not absolute and there's a significant slope scope for discussion and differentials. With understanding of a few basic concepts and not panicking, you are well equipped to scoring high. As my teacher often said, correct observation, meticulous documentation and thoughtful analysis are the three pillars of correct management, not only in strabismus, but for any case that you get in your exam and even later in life. I've divided today's class into three parts. First is how to approach a strabismus case. Without going into the details, I would be highlighting the points which should not be missed. Next, I would be touching on the often asked and confusing management guidelines, like which I to operate and how much to operate. Finally, I would be discussing some usual strabismus long cases with the viva questions and their expected answers. In case you have a break in attention, you can see the stage of the class at the bottom left hand side of the slide. Right? So let's start with the class. Before the exams, I suggest that the postgraduates have the case sheet of all specialty clinics in their mind. This would ensure a systematic approach and prevent you from missing out on any important points due to the stress of the exam. I would be going through our strabismus case sheet here. Important points in the history which are often missed are those of uh, the fami familial history, history of trauma, perinatal history is significant in patients of strabismus as there's a whole class of deviations which occur with perinatal insight. Past treatment and systemic histories are important. Remember to ask for old photographs. Now, do, uh, don't jump to doing a cover test the moment you get a strabismus case. Remember to take the vision or uh, at least ask for if, if you have a very small child and attempt to do a cycloplegic refraction. Sometimes in exams, you may not be expected to perform the entire cycloplegic refraction yourself but you must ask from the, for, for the findings of the refraction from the exam attendant. After you've uh, documented the appropriate vision, 
and have an idea of the refraction, then you proceed with the examination. Now the examination is divided in cases of strabismus into motor and sensory. Both these heads have to be addressed. They will be discussed in slightly greater detail in the subsequent slides. Now at the end of a adequate history and examination, you should have a differential diagnosis in your mind. Now, usually students become so focused on strabismus that they forget about the very obvious things like presence of myopia, presence of a corneal opacity. And you must also mention the systemic issues that the child has like Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. All these should be included in your final differential diagnosis. Now coming to examination, as I've already told you, it is divided into three parts. And these parts would be addressed in the subsequent slides. You should be aware of the age appropriate method for assessing the, fix fix uh, assessing the vision of the child. Sometimes how readily the child fixes is enough for you to have an idea of the visual acuity. If the vision is subnormal, have amblyopia in your mind, but don't uh, be too early to jump onto the diagnosis of amblyopia before you have ruled out all the other causes. Age appropriate cycloplegic refraction should be performed and the refraction of choice in our uh, set of population is atropine. You must observe the pupillary reflex when the child is dilated. It gives you an idea of the media opacities and also of the refractive status. It also tells you about the deviation. Have an idea of the deviation under cycloplegia as it takes care of the accommodative effort. When the child is dilated, retina examination and assessment of fixation should not be missed. We now come to the motor examination. You must be aware of the three components of the head posture, the face turn, the head tilt, and the chin elevation or depression. Keep in mind that the CHP due to ocular causes gets eliminated when one eye is occluded. <laughs> the Hirschberg tests gives you an idea of the deviation, which should be confirmed on the cover test. Please practice cover test beforehand. This is the basic of strabismus examination. I would be showing you a small video of the cover test in the next slide. Now the confusion between phoria and tropia is universal among the postgraduates. Just remember that if the squint is present any time when both eyes are open, it is a tropia, right? Usually plastic prisms, plastic prism bar is used and it is held in the frontal position irrespective of the deviation. Now, if you are dealing with an incompetent deviation, remember to ask for Hess chart. Also remember that you do not order or ask for a Hess chart if the patient does not have to be a That is a prerequisite for performing a Hess chart. Do not forget to check and document motility limitation. And keep in mind that you are checking for versions, ductions, and vergences. Don't talk about limited motility purely on basis of versions. Now, this is a video showing cover test and pay attention firstly to the video. You see, the head posture has to be eliminated. Test both with, with and without glasses. Testing has to be done both for distance and near. And use an accommodative target when you are doing the cover test for near. And prisms are being used over the non-fixating light.
at this stage of your examination, you should have an idea whether you are dealing with a competent deviation or an incompetent deviation. Forgetting to check the sensory status of the child in an examination is not acceptable. You should know how to perform the work for dot tests and its interpretation. A properly done diplopia chart will give you the diagnosis besides good marks. Use appropriate tests for stereopsis and remember to document them properly. Now, as you complete your history and examination, you should take some time to think and answer these questions. Is the patient that you are dealing with actually having strabismus? What is the visual acuity, refraction, motor, and the sensory status of the patient? Jot down these headings in your answer sheet and try to answer them. And if you are dealing with strabismus, what type of strabismus is this? And what are the differentials? Okay. Now with this, we come to the second part of today's class where we will be dealing with the confusing aspects of strabismus management. First of all, what is the goal of strabismus management? Now the goal can be divided into sensory goals and motor goals. Having said that, please remember that if the sensory goals are achieved, the motor goals are automatically achieved. In sensory go goals, we wish to achieve normal stereopsis and fusion in all cases. This is ideal. However, this is usually not achievable. So we try to achieve this in the functional positions. That is the in the primary position and the down base. And we also aim to restore the normal visual activity. Coming to motor goals, they are slightly different in patients with esotropia and in exotropia. In esotropia, orthotropia is ideal. And if this is not achievable, the second best is microtropia. And if even that is not achievable, a deviation within 10 prism diopters of orthotropia is also an acceptable outcome. However, in exotropia, we usually aim for a small consecutive esotropia, except in very small children. And for sensory deviations, a small esotropia is desirable post-operative. Next is before you uh, jump on to uh, talking about the surgery, you must talk about the non-surgical options to your examiner. The first non-surgical option is refraction and prescription of appropriate glasses. This is the mainstay of strabismus treatment. Next is preventing amblyopia and if it is present you wish to treat it. Orthoptic exercises have a definite role in convergence insufficiency and low fusional range type of intermittent exotropia. Prisms they work well in small angle deviations. Chemo denervation with botulinum toxin should be considered in small children with esotropia, in paralytic deviations to facilitate recovery, and in residual deviations after surgery. Now coming to the surgical confusions. Now the residents often confuse about which eye to operate. I've tried to simplify this confusion here. Remember that in formatant deviations with demonstrable binocularity, or where you expect that the binocularity will be good post-operatively, you operate on the eye with better vision. And if such is not the case, you operate on the eye with worse vision. In presence of paresis, usually the peritic eye is operated, except in very rare conditions that the patient prefers to fix with the non peritic eye. When the eye doesn't reach the midline in paresis, you have to take help of the adjacent non-paralyzed muscles in transposition procedures. 
And the first step in restrictive strabismus management is to relieve the restriction. Now, the next is what surgery should be done? So, uh, it is easy to remember that in comitant horizontal deviations, the surgery that is usually performed is recession, resection surgery of one eye. For the simple reason that RNR surgery requires surgery only in one eye, and it is always easier to convince the parents and the patient himself or herself, if she's old enough, up for one eye surgery. Exceptions being very small children with esotropia, where we prefer a bimedial recession and pure divergence excess type of exotropias, where the deviation from near is negligible, where we prefer a bilateral lateral rectus recession. Or very large deviations where you wish to operate on three horizontal muscles. Now the next is how much surgery should be performed. I have placed a simple normogram here based on various scores and this is the expected correction in prism diopters per millimeter of surgery on the horizontal rectum. You can see that medial rectus recession is the most effective surgery followed by recession of the lateral rectus and the least effective is resection of the medial rectus. Now, whether you take five or four, four or three in the table here depends on these criteria. You take a, the higher value when most of these criteria are being met. That is, the deviation is large, the age is small, you are performing R and R together in smaller eyes and in strabismus of recent onset. To more to strengthen this concept in your mind, I'm going to be showing you an example. I would want you to think and try to answer this. I've copied the normogram that which I showed in the previous slide here. And what I'm asking you is that we are having a 15 year old child, 15 year old uh, young adult with a long standing deviation of minus 40 PD, prism diopters, that is an exotropia. Axial length is mentioned here, and we aim a consecutive isotropia of five prism diopters. That is, we want to correct 45 prism diopters of deviation. So please think for half a minute and have in your mind what surgery would you want to do? You could either operate on one eye or you could do both eyes. Right. So, if we are doing a single eye surgery, that is RNR surgery, we would probably achieve this correction with a 10 mm recession of the lateral rectus with a 7 mm resection of the medial rectus. Here I've used the value three and a half here and one and a half here, we've used the middle values for the reason that you see here that two of the values variables are being met. One is that the deviation is large and second is that we are performing R and R together. As a second option, we could also perform a bilateral lateral rectus recession, but here I am expecting a correction of three prism diopters per millimeter of surgery on the lateral rectus for the reason that only one of these criteria is being met that we are dealing with a large deviation. Having understood this, we move on to the third part of the class today, probably the most interesting part for all of you, the usual long cases. Now, the usual long cases that you can get in the exam are esotropia. It will usually be an infantile esotropia because accommodative esotropia is avoided by the examiners as it requires a longer workup than is probably possible during the exam. Now, exotropia may be intermittent or constant. You may get a sensory deviation. And remember 
that while you are preparing for your viva on the strabismus, the viva may actually shift to the cause of poor vision. Like you may have a viva on cornea if the patient is having a corneal obesity, or you may be asked about retinal detachment if the patient has a RD, which has resulted in the deviation. In incompetent deviations, usually you are given sixth nerve or third nerve policies. And in restrictive deviations, by far, Duan syndrome is the favorite. Now we will be dealing with some of these conditions. The usual presentation of infantile esotropia is in children. However, you may get an adolescent or an adult in your exam. The salient features would be early onset, large angle, and a normal perinatal history. The refractive status is usually equivocal. Now, remember, when you are dealing with a patient with esotropia to perform the refraction and visual acuity assessment, look for inferior oblique overaction as it is commonly associated. Patterns are common. You must not miss them. You must check whether you are dealing with an alternator or the child has a preferential fixation. And have a list of differentials in your mind the common one screen, policy of the sixth nerve, long-standing one, which has spread, which has had a spread of comitants, a Duan syndrome, accommodative deviation. Now this you can simply rule out by having a near distance discrepancy in the deviation. And antenatal neurological insult is also associated with these deviations. And these can be or excluded or included on basis of a careful history. Now, what would be the usual viva questions once you get a patient with esotropia? How did you assess the visual equity? Or how would you like to assess the visual equity? Please start with readiness to fixate. Readiness to fixate and to ability to hold fixation with either of the eyes is probably the most useful tool in preverbal children. What are your differentials? We've discussed them in the previous slide and we'll be discussing them in subsequent cases as well. What management options do you have? As I told you, small children with esotropia, we often prefer a bimedial recession. What we want to hear is that Thus, management should not be delayed. Esotropia, infantile esotropia occurs in infancy and it has a strong propensity to development of dense amblyopia. So, you must insist on early alignment of eyes. Right? So, that early alignment, just another slide about the management is I want to re emphasize that we want to prevent amblyopia and the most effective thing to prevent amblyopia is occlusion. And this should be started on the first visit when you get the patient of esotropia and when the child is waiting for surgery. Early surgery, that is the gold standard for infantile esotropia. In an exceptional situation where the parents are unwilling for surgery, the child is at risk for general anesthesia due to comorbid conditions or the deviation is like the child is too small for you to assess the deviation accurately, you go in for botulinum toxin. It is also indicated that there has been some uh, antenatal insult and you are unsure whether this esotropia is related to actually the antenatal insult or it is infantile esotropia. In this, these patients, you want to align the eyes early and the choice is botulinum toxin. You must also be aware that the patients need to be counseled for resurgery and long term follow up in this type of strabismus. An average of two or more surgeries are required for optimum outcome. Now we come to the second uh, type of deviation that we will be discussing today. And this is by far the commonest long case that you will get in your exam. The patient is usually a young adult and you must remember 
that the history of uh, initially that the patient was able to control and now is unable to control is common although you may be getting a patient with constant deviation also remember that variability is associated with this type of stratospasms the i've seen students panic and uh, get restless that at one moment the stratospasms is there the other moment it is not there when they make the patient sit in front of the examiner the stratospasms becomes obvious and then the patient patient was being examined by you the stratospasms was not there don't panic just dissociate the eyes with a good cover test or red green glasses or polaroid glasses and the deviation will be obvious ask the patient to focus at far distance the deviation will be obvious ask him to look in the up gaze the deviation will be there you should be aware of how to perform the patch test although the time in the exam may be short for you to do it but this would be a common question that you would be asked as we want the deviation to be manifest again patterns are commonly associated with this type of deviation have a list of differentials in your mind common ones being in an older patient partial or recovered cut nerve and in a younger patient associated neurological or antenatal insult now these two can be easily ruled out or ruled in with a careful history and a little bit of examination this slide has been put up here to show you the v pattern exotropia with bilateral overaction of the inferior obliques which is quite commonly associated with this condition here i want to tell you that a worsening exophoria into an intermittent exotropia leading to a constant exotropia are all part of the same disease with gradually worsening fusional control the exotropia is divided into these four types and they are based on whether the deviation is more for distance is it same for distance and near or it is more for near a special type here is the simulated divergence excess where initially the deviation appears more for distance but once you perform the patch test and eliminate the fusion you realize that the deviation is equal both for near and distance so although you may not be able to perform the patch test or uh, exclude or include this in your diagnosis the examiners want to ask you about this in the exam what will be the usual viva questions associated with exotropia what are the different types they are shown here in this very same slide how did you perform the patch test or how you would want to perform the patch test <coughs> what is the prism adaptation test now the prism adaptation test is important because we want to uh i'll just tell you what prism adaptation test is for those of you who don't know we prescribe the prisms to the patient and we gradually realize that the need for prisms is gradually increasing the patient seems to be the the deviation seems to be increasing when the prism is prescribed so we want to get the maximum deviation manifest because the surgery is planned to correct the maximum deviation what management options can you think of so the management options again would be a rnr surgery of one eye or bilateral lateral rectus dissection in pure divergence excess type of deviations now you must know that not all exotropia patients require surgery deviations which are asymptomatic manifest occasionally or are lesser than 15 prism diopters can be managed by exercises you should be aware of one of the scoring systems like the newcastle control score or the mayo clinic score and base your decision to operate on them we have already discussed the surgical options earlier and we move on to the next case here the third nerve palsy this is another favorite with the examiners for the simple reason that the viva can be taken in any direction 
we can ask you about mood of thermology we can ask you about strabismus if you are in the mood or we can talk to you about oculoplasty now the etiology of third nerve palsy depends on the age of the patient in children congenital and trauma are common and in adults aneurysm and microvasculopathy are the common conditions here the most important question is have you checked the pupillary reaction and are you aware of its significance i am sure most of you know the answer but just to repeat that if the pupil is involved it means a compressive lesion from outside and if it is spared we are usually dealing with a microvasculopathy <coughs> you must perform the ptosis workup in these patients don't get confused about the nerve supply of lps and auricularis have it clear in your mind and the usual viva questions the nerve supply of the various extraocular muscles of the lps of the orbicularis and the examiner would like to confuse you ask you about the nerve supply of the intraocular muscles and so on the probable site of lesions depending on the involvement of the pupil or involvement of the specific muscles which are which are there which are being which are being involved by the palsy you will be asked about the third nerve nucleus have the picture of the third nerve nucleus in your mind as you go for the viva the bilateral representation of the superior rectus and the single large nucleus of the lps now sometimes you are asked to check for the fourth nerve in the presence of third nerve palsy so what we want to hear is that you ask the patient to adduct the eye and you look for the intorsion movement that is how we check for the fourth nerve in presence of third nerve what management options you have or the management options could be firstly it will be a staged procedure you would take help from the unparalyzed muscle what would you like to do what is the prognosis the prognosis in third nerve which is non resolving is usually guarded you might achieve a straight eye but you will never be able to make the patient totally diplopia free and what is bla and you think if any of you know the answer i congratulate you the what we are expecting to hear is breast left alone so third nerve palsy in an adult which is non resolving a large deviation is best left alone with the process because if you correct the process the diplopia will be very troublesome if you align the eyes you bring the two images together with very limited motility the patient is never happy so you better leave the patient alone do do no harm now coming to the sixth nerve palsy this is the commonest incompetent squint given as a long case the etiology will depend on the age of the patient now in children hydrocephalus and trauma are common in adults microvasculopathy is the common now you are dealing with an incompetent strabismus with diplopia remember to perform the diplopia chart and ask for the hes chart document the motility limitation remember perform the ductions disc examination you can't get away by not performing the disc examination in a patient with six nerve palsy and the reason is obvious disc examination with palsy in one eye and probably some kind form of a paresis in the other eye is essential because it could be a false localizing sign for raised intracranial pressure and it would be criminal to miss out on it now you must remember that in paralytic deviations management of the cause is done initially for example you would like to control the diabetes while the management of the palsy itself is conservative with alternate occlusion b complex supplementation and botulinum toxin if that is needed monthly follow ups are advised definitive management is not done till about 6 months after the onset with at least 3 months of documented slave stable deviation <coughs> now this slide here has been put up to reemphasize the fact that this lady is having a bilateral sixth nerve paresis 
and you must remember to examine the optic discs. This lady was actually having a raised intracranial pressure, and the involvement of the sixth nerve was secondary to it. You must know how to perform the diplopia chart and document it properly. When you are documenting it, remember to mention the cases, the dextro version and the levo version. Do mention that the red filter is over which I. It is a double uh, check to ensure that you have placed it over the red eye, over the right eye, if you write it down. So you are going to check it. See that the deviation is maximum in which case. And also remember that the further image belongs to the paralyzed eye. Now, I will give you another 20 seconds to think about the diagnosis here. Right, so we are dealing with left lateral vector spikes. Now, a few words about the HES chart. HES charting is important to understand. You should all practice HES charting in your post graduation. Although in exam, you will not be performing the HES chart, but if you get a patient of six nerve palsy, you will definitely receive a HES chart to interpret. Note here that. In the right eye, there is limitation of abduction. There is marked overaction of its yoke muscle, that is the contralateral medial vectors. There is overaction of the direct antagonist of the lateral vectors, that is the medial vectors. The smaller chart belongs to the paralyzed eye. Now I would be talking about how you manage, how do you base your surgical decisions based on the HES chart? This is important to know. Here you are dealing with the lateral rectus palsy and a marked overaction of its antagonist. <coughs> so the rule is that you weaken the most overacting muscle, which in this case is the medial rectus here. As the eye is reaching the midline, resection of the paralyzed muscle would also be effective. So this patient will perform RNR surgery of the paralyzed eye. In other, in here, in another example, same case, same type of case. There's the paralysis of the lateral rectus muscle here, but the most overacting muscle is its yoke, the contralateral medial rectus. And you see that the deviation in the primary gaze is not too large. So this patient would benefit with any guesses. If any of you have put in the answer in the chat box. Okay, I'll give you the answer. We perform recession of these, this overacting muscle. And as the deviation is not significant in the primary position, we would also be well off by performing a posterior fixation suture or Faden suture on this muscle. Answers like, like this will give you very good marks in the exam. Now remember that if the eye is not reaching, reaching the midline in absence of any restriction, which is confirmed on the force duction test, resecting the muscle will not restore the motility and help will be required from the vertical rectal. The two popular ones, which are often asked are transposition, half or full tender, and the Jensen muscle union. Have these diagrams in your mind. Now, we often ask that what more would you do, supposing you need to perform greater surgery. So the, the students often tell us that we would do an RNR surgery with the transposition. Now that would be suicidal because that would lead definitely to the anterior segment ischemia if you perform so many muscles. So what we want to hear is that you would have an option of chemo denervation or botulinum toxin into the overacting medial rectus muscle. <coughs> that would just keep the anterior segment supply intact and prevent the occurrence of anterior segment is needed.
the usual viva questions how did you identify the primary and secondary deviation can you demonstrate it for us <coughs> do you know of the spread of comatins how does it occur can you interpret this as chart what are the other false localizing signs that you know of how do you differentiate between paresis and paresy and what management options do you have you can perform an rnr surgery you can perform transposition weakening of the yolk we have discussed and the fardan procedure now the commonest type of restrictive deviation that you can get in your exam is the do and send the patient may be a child or a young adult the older the patient more difficult to rule out the differentiates the salient features are presence of a compensatory head posture deviation and associated palpable facial changes which have been noticed since birth or early childhood and the most important thing is for any restrictive deviation and also true for duan syndrome is motility limitation which is significantly greater than the deviation in primary gaze you see here that the primary gaze the eyes look straight however there is marked motility limitation in abduction in the left eye the three common types or in fact the three types of the duan syndrome which you should have in mind are type 1 which is commonest there is limitation on abduction and the patient usually has esotropia the second type is usually having exotropia and there is limitation in adduction and in type 3 both abduction and adduction are limited and the patient usually has an esotropia the usual viva questions that you will encounter are how do you know that this is a restrictive deviation and what test could you perform to confirm it? the answer we are looking for is forced duction testing what are ccdds i am sure most of you know this these are congenital cranial disintegration disorders and duan syndrome is one of them you are expected to know other types of ccdds what etiopathogenesis can you think of and it is most commonly seen that the sixth nerve and its nucleus are involved in duan syndrome the muscles are by and large normal what investigation would you perform to rule out or rule in duan syndrome and the answer is we would perform a magnetic resonance imaging focusing on the sixth nerve and its course in the involved site what differentials do you have in mind we'll be discussing the differentials in the next slide how do you perform an fdt how do you perform the fdt and how are the binocular functions in a patient with duan syndrome remember that if the patient is adopting a head posture he is doing it to enjoy binocularity so if the patient has head posture the patient will have stereopsis in the central field however the binocularity would be alternate suppression or suppression of the involved eye in other areas of the field what management options can you think of now the suicidal answer here would be performing a resection you never resect in duan syndrome and we usually do a resection or a differential recession we would recess both the horizontal recti to take care of the uh, palpebral fascia changes and to reduce the upshoot and the downshoot we can do a y split of the lateral rectus and performing a resection would only worsen the palpebral fascia abnormality and the lobe retraction now this is a table to tell you about these three conditions which we have discussed today and how do you differentiate between them chp would occur in the first two of them first two the congenital sixth nerve and the drs are incompetent deviations so you would get a larger secondary deviation probe retraction 
is a feature of Duan syndrome. Small angle in primary position is again a feature of restrictive, restrictive strabismus seen in Duan syndrome. Alternating isotropia, feature of infantile isotropia. And I told you that deviation not corresponding to the limitation of movement is a feature of Duan syndrome. And even after all the detailed history and even after examination, sometimes you are unable to differentiate between these conditions. So better keep a differential diagnosis. The examiners are usually happy that you have a differential diagnosis rather than a straightforward diagnosis. There's more to discuss and it also confirms that you've not been fed the diagnosis by someone. You have made a logical thinking and logical conclusion. So always go with a differential diagnosis in mind. Don't run after the diagnosis. Now, this is the concluding slide. So remember, systematic approach is the mainstay. Have history, vision, refraction, motor, and sensory mentioned on your answer sheet. Have, think about each of these and mention the answers. Meticulous documentation goes a long way. Remember to manage your time. Have time to correlate your findings. Also remember that strabismus is the branch, is, is the subspecialty that entire examination is not possible in a single city. The examiners are well aware of it. But you must have in mind that what you have performed and what you would like to perform in the next sitting and why you were unable to do it today. Just have this clear in your mind and you are through. And I cannot overemphasize the soft skills how you talk to the patient, how you explain the procedure, how you do the procedure, what is your empathy? These are more important than you can all ever think, not only in the exam, but even much after in your practice. And my best wishes are you for your exam and for a successful career in ophthalmology. I can be reached on this email and this phone number on WhatsApp for further clarifications. I would be happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think our PGs are like really lucky. And thanks to Santosh mm -hmm. sir, for such a platform because they have access to teachers like you for the amazing cases that you have compiled and all the Viva questions. I think they can just quickly look at it before the exams and they are kind of like prepared for it. So thank you so much for that. I'm sure it, I think, took a lot of time from your side also to put together all the important questions. <laughs> Thank you. A lot, <laughs> lot of help from my colleagues. Names mentioned here. Yes, sir. Uh, so not like any case specific, but like generic questions we have, I think all of them, because as you said that uh, whenever we get a squint case, all of us get very uh, yeah. nervous for the exam. So... Uh, <laughs> few questions are uh, what are the basics of pediatric retinoscopy uh, and how to deal if we get a child who's not very cooperative but still we have to do a ret perform a retinoscopy in exam so any yeah. tips for that so so the tip is to make the child comfortable the child mm -hmm. is most comfortable in the lap of his or her parent and the posture is that the uh, child is comfortably against the parent and the parent's back is towards you and the child is overlooking from the side, like the, this would be the case, the child would be in close proximity to the parent, the parent's back is towards you, and the face of the child is facing you, right? Ensure good cycloplegia, the child should not be hungry, have the milk bottle in his or her mouth, uh, sweet would be helpful, and even if that doesn't work, you can uh, sedate the child, a sedated child just lift up the lids, and if the child is not hungry, he'll continue to sleep and you can go ahead with the retinoscopy. Using a streak is helpful because then you can even stand and perform it. Use the retinoscopy paddles, which have the lenses, uh, the, the usual lenses in, incorporated in them. So you don't have to change between the lenses and you can do it quickly in that case. Take help from your optometrist. I've seen that uh, some of our qualified, experienced optometrists are expert with children. They would help give you many more tips that none of us ophthalmologists can. So having a, a senior optometrist 
would again be a boom. And you have to learn from them. Learning should come from all sources, not only from teachers like us. But once you are in your in, in an institute, you learn from so many things from your optometrist, from your paramedics, the people who are performing the tests like OCT, funders camera, never miss out on these opportunities. Yeah, I, as a postgraduate, I remember take, like, keeping chocolates in case I got mm. pediatric cases. Yeah. I think yeah. that can be another tip and handy. Uh, the next one is, uh, can you please explain how do we avoid confusion while interpreting a HES charting? Oh, that would, be a, that would be a long question, long answer. <laughs> and uh, any like, source from which we can actually like any online source where the PGs can go and there are, uh, offhand I can't remember any any place where the HES charting has been discussed in detail but you must have these important concepts in your mind that firstly the smaller field belongs to the paralyzed type right and you must look for the overaction and the underaction the central area of the squares is important. Eliminate the head posture when you are performing it. The most overacting muscle, the underacting muscle. And uh, now the usual HES charting is gradually becoming replaced by the digital HES, which is giving you the interpretations also. But as postgraduate, you should definitely practice HES charting. And uh, if any PG is interested in knowing in more detail, they can contact me on WhatsApp or my email. I will definitely respond with a proper link for this answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next one is, uh, what is the importance of distant direct uh, of thalmoscopy in pediatric cases? Distant direct of thalmoscopy is important not only in pediatric cases, but in all cases. You see, once you pick up your direct of thalmoscope to peep into the fundus, you must first perform a distant direct of thalmoscope. It gives you an idea of so many things that you miss, even on slit lamp examination. It gives you an idea of the media opacity. It, you have a rough idea of the refractive error. As you uh, go forward or you move the glow, it gives you an idea of the location of the media opacity, whether it is anterior to the nodal point or posterior to the nodal point. So distant direct of thalmoscopy should be the basic examination which you perform as a reflex tool prior to having a peep into the retina. Sure, sir. And so I think the last one you had already described, like the case sheets, I think that we all should keep in mind. How do we yeah. mentally take sequence of examination just before the exam to avoid missing any essential examination part? See, uh, if you have examined cases during your residency, if you have done five cases of each subspeciality independently, keeping in mind that you don't forget anything, I'm sure the examiner, if the examination will be a cakewalk, you just need to remember how you performed the previous examination of a similar case. If you've not performed examination during the, your residency, no amount of mugging up is going to help. You remember, uh, you, you should understand that during the exam, what the examiner is looking for is not the knowledge. The examiner is looking for whether you have actually seen patients, whether you have known the correct technique. See, knowledge you keep learning throughout your life, but the correct procedure, whether you know how to uh, examine the cornea, whether you know how to make a labeled diagram for the cornea, whether you know how to examine a patient of strabismus, you know how to perform a cover test, your interpretation may be faulty. But your procedure should be correct. You should not randomly start covering one eye and ask the patient to fix it. You must first see whether the patient is actually able to fix with both the eyes. You are performing cover test in a child who's not following torch light. Just tell that you've not actually done your examination stepwise. If you start your cover test and the first step that you do is that you occlude the already deviating guy. Doesn't make sense. The deviation is so obvious. What are you gaining by occluding the deviated eye? The first step you should do is occlude the fixing eye. Then you see the movement in the non-fixing eye. So, see a lot of patients. Remember to see them carefully, see them independently. Note down your findings. Note down your uh, findings as you would do in an exam. And then go back. 
check the case sheet again and see the points that you have missed discussed with your discuss with your peers discuss with your seniors if i can tell you that during the exam what actually flashes in front of your mind is not what you've read in the book what flashes in front of your mind is the discussions you've had with your colleagues the patients that you've seen and they are the ones which are going to take you through so have a good peer group there's no substitute for that there's no textbook no reading no youtube video no class like this can substitute for that discuss 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 that's the mantra mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember like the best tip that I got from my seniors was never to ask about the final diagnosis of the cases that are kept in the exam. Never, never. That that would that it. would be missing. That would be missing. Yeah, we get so biased, and if you don't yeah. get to it, in you, examining, you, you, then you 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 then try to fix the findings according to the diagnosis, and that will have a catastrophic result. Because the examiners are smart enough. Just yeah. remember, we have all been through the exam. We know what goes on, so. we don't appreciate cheating we don't appreciate telling lies if you forgotten to do something don't try to cook it up say straight away sir i forgot we are all humans we are we are there to help you we are there to pass you just get it out of your mind that the examiner wants to fail you <laughs> no one wants to fail you we all want to pass you but if you make a mistake that is going to harm the patient in a irreversible manner or you continue making this mistake repeatedly during your exam or we realize that you are telling lies you are trying to cover it up right now that would be catastrophic yeah. yeah so thank you so much sir again i'll just quickly share my slide once because i have an announcement to make for the next one um yeah so this is regarding the eye focus physical event which is like the most awaited event uh, pre covid we had like such a nice uh, participation from all our postgraduate students so it is back and it will be happening in uh, new delhi from february 26 to march 5th and we have only limited uh, registration so 300 delegates so so that we can make good arrangements for all of you so i really hope that all of you register soon one is that and the next class uh, will be uh, i'll just quickly unshare this and the next class is november 9th which is a master class again in mr abismas and our overview uh, by dr t s surendra so and thank you so much sir today for all the cases yeah. and, uh, the talk that you compiled uh, thank you for having me here and it was a Really it was a pleasure, pleasure sir really. and thank you so much it was really a nice and crisp talk with all the viva questions and i really liked how you compiled it together so thank, thank you, you so much okay thank you sir good night